Today we are going to be talking about uh, SQL, a uh, lot of SQL. Today is SQL day, primarily. And uh, in the course of the lecture, I'm going to go a little bit slow and give you the opportunity to ask questions. And as you just saw, we also have a, a database viewer ready. So we can even try out queries. We can write queries on the fly and uh, see how they work. Okay, so I want it to be an interactive sort of session. So please do ask questions. Um, so yesterday, I guess you a little bit about SQL, and in the lab, you tried out some queries. Um, but we will go over the same things more formally today, and uh, give you, a, you know, more time to see, uh, to uh, understand what is going on. Uh, the key thing to remember is that S when you program in SQL, it's different from programming in COBOL. You are all used to an imperative style of programming, where you say, uh, do this step, do this next step, and so on. You have a loop, you have an if-then-else. SQL is very different. There is no if then else. Well, there is, but that's in procedural SQL, not in the basic SQL. So there is no if then else. There is no loop. So the entire way you think about how to write queries is completely different from what you're used to. So it takes a little bit of time to adjust to this and uh, to understand how to write queries, especially complex queries. The most simple queries, it's obvious. You use select from where you're done. But as things get a little more complex, it's a little bit different. And today, we are going to try to uh, help you start on that path. So uh, what all are we going to cover today? We'll be uh, talking about the basic uh, stru query structure of SQL, some basic set operations. We'll also talk about aggregate functions, uh, null values, and nested subqueries. So uh, you saw examples of SQL yesterday. This is uh, the general form of an simple SQL query. There are, of course, a lot more constructs. But the basic SQL query looks like this. Select, and then a list of attributes or column names from a list of relation names where some condition p. Okay, what exactly does this mean? Um, SQL queries like this can actually be understood in terms of the relational algebra. I'm not sure how much of relational algebra was covered yesterday. But did you uh, look at the join operation yesterday? Yes. The select operation and the project operation. Okay. So what an SQL query like this formally means is you take the relations which are listed here, R1 through Rm here, whatever the relation names are. Formally, this is not actually how it is executed. But to understand what the meaning of the query is, think of first taking a cross product. <coughs> what is a cross product of two? Uh, tables combine. combine every pair of rows from those two tables. If you have three tables, well, every combination. So if you have m tables, every combination of a row from this table, a row from the second, from the third, and so on. So take all possible row combinations. Now, from the examples you saw yesterday, you will realize that most of these row combinations are pretty irrelevant from the viewpoint of the query. You don't want all combinations. You want a customer to be matched to their accounts, not to all possible accounts. Whereas a cross product does what? It does every possible pairing. So the where clause uh, over here, the condition P, gets translated into a select. So you have all uh, the combinations of rows. And then from that, you filter out only those rows that satisfy whatever predicate you have given. We'll see more examples. And finally, you project out the uh, columns which you have specified in the select clause. Now, the uh, relation algebra select denoted by sigma here is obviously different from the SQL select here. The SQL select here, the clause, is actually corresponds to the projection. And the relational algebra select corresponds to the where clause. And the from clause corresponds to taking the cross product. So it's very simple. And the result of an SQL query is a relation. That's what is nice about uh, these languages, relational language. You take in one or more relations, and then you output a relation. Now, this in turn can be used to do other things. So if you want to build a complex query, you can break it up into parts, get a temporary relation for one part, then get another temporary relation for another part maybe, then join them, and then aggregate them, and so forth. So the select clause, um, as we have seen, lists the attributes. And here is a, another simple example. You probably. Uh, seen this already, but let me just describe it anyway. 
uh, you have a relation loan with three attributes, loan number, branch name, and amount. And this query, select branch name from loan, results in this relation, which has a single column branch name, and then the values, downtown, Redwood, and Perry Ridge, which are the same as here. Okay. What if there are uh, two loans from the downtown branch, let us say? Then what will happen here? In this result, there will be two downtowns here. So duplicates can occur in SQL. If you don't want duplicates, you can get rid of them as we will see. Another thing to note when you do programming in SQL is that SQL names are case insensitive. It doesn't matter what case you use, upper or lower. I think, I believe COBOL is also similar, so you are used to that. And as we just saw, SQL allows duplicates, and if you do not want the duplicates, just add the keyword distinct after the select. So select distinct branch name from loan guarantees that each branch name will occur exactly once. And if you want to explicitly say that, do not remove duplicate, you can say select all. But if you do not say anything also, it is the same. That is the default behavior. Now, why would you want duplicates? We will see. There are cases where you want to like, get all the balances and then sum them up. Then you do not want to remove duplicates. But in other cases, you want to remove duplicates. So that control is in your hands. There are uh, some syntactic uh, features which are useful. If you want to select all columns, you can say select star from loan. So that is all the columns of loan. And uh, the select clause can also contain any expression. In the simplest case, you have arithmetic expressions with numbers, integers, and floating point numbers, and so on. Uh, you can do uh, the usual plus, minus, star, division, and so forth. However, there are also other things you can do in there which are also very useful. You can uh, have string functions, as you will see, concatenating strings, and so forth. So here is a simple example. Um, select known number, branch name, and amount times 100 from loan. So if, you, if this were the input, this is the output. You have loan number, branch name, which is the same. And amount, 3,000 becomes 30,000, 4,000 becomes 40,000, and this becomes 17,000. What about the name of this column? So whenever you have a query in SQL, the output has column names. This is important because the next level up, if you want to use that uh, relation, you need to be able to refer to a column of the relation. Uh, 1,700 times, oh, sorry, my arithmetic. Uh, I need to go back to kindergarten. Uh, that I should have put uh, 10 there. So there, let's fix it. <laughs> Good. Okay. Um, so what is the name of that? Oh, multiplied by 100. Okay, let's do it really right. Okay, there we go. Um, so, what about the name of this column? For the two columns which were directly there in the select list, the name is the same. What about this guy's name? What do you call it? It's not clear. Can you call it uh, amount? No, it's a, in, you, you could have added two columns to get it, so there is no obvious name to give it. So the name in this case would be sort of system dependent. The SQL does not define exactly what name should appear there. However, if you want to act, if you're just putting it to the <coughs> screen or uh, if you have a program that picks up the third attribute, you can always refer to a column position. So this is the third column. Even if it does not have a name, if you access it from COBOL or Java and so forth, you can actually access the third column of the result. So you don't need to give a name necessarily. But if you wish to give it a name, there is a way, uh, which we will see in a couple of slides from now. So now, uh, coming back to the uh, where clause, um, this specifies whatever conditions the result must satisfy. And here is an example where we have two conditions. Uh, this is same select loan number from loan, where branch name is Perry Ridge and amount greater than. 1,200. So you can, just like in any programming language, you can have arbitrary combination. We have seen the comparison operations uh, examples here. This is all standard, just like in COBOL or any other programming language. Uh, there are a few uh, other uh, details which uh, you can use. For example, SQL has a between comparison operator. 
so you can say um, select loan number from loan where amount is between 90,000 and 100,000. Okay, and what does between mean? It's an inclusive between, less than or uh, equal to 100,000 and greater than or equal to 90,000. It's a syntactic sugar as it can obviously be written using two, uh, the, uh, the and of two conditions. So now let's come to the from clause. This is where the Cartesian product is occurring. And here is a query which does not even have a where clause. This is a valid query. It may not be a useful query, but it is a syntactically valid query. So what does this query do? Select star from borrower loan. So let's take this very small loan and it's a very small borrower relation. And the result would have nine rows, three times three, when I don't have space here to show all of them. So I've just shown the first three rows. Um, actually, the order of the rows is not defined. This is important. SQL does not guarantee anything about the order in which output comes. If you want ordering, there is a way as we will see, using order by. So I think this is uh, something different from your normal uh, imperative language where if you are reading a file, you know the order in which the data is in the file. It's going to come in that order. And then if you do an operation on that, you know exactly what order the result is going to be. But in SQL, there is absolutely no guarantee. So this can be a little uh, troublesome at times in that uh, you write a program, you get everything in the order you want, and then you deploy it somewhere else on a different database, and suddenly the order is completely different from what you have been used to. Okay, this can happen. So anywhere where you depend on the order, you have to explicitly do an order by, which we will see. So anyway, uh, coming back to this, uh, the cross product in this case would have nine tuples. Uh, three of those tuples would correspond to the first row here, matching each of the three rows here. The next three uh, in whatever order would be maybe the second row here and all three here, and then the third row here matched with these three. Okay, I'm going slow here so that I don't lose anybody. This is critical to understand the rest of SQL. No, select star does not mean cross product. The from borrower loan without a where clause results in a cross product. If you add a where clause, you will have a cross product logically, and then from the cross product, you will filter out certain rows and only output those rows. Okay, but, but if it shows all the combinations, mm. the select star says all columns. All, all Show all attributes. So in this case, all of them appear in the result. This, this from clause without a where gives the cross product. The star does not mean cross product. The star is not a multiplication. Maybe that's what you're thinking. Absolutely not. The star sim select star simply means output all the columns. Don't suppress any column. Okay. Whereas the cross product is for different rows, and that is purely from the from clause. The from clause all always logically creates a cross product, and then the where clause filters out. Now, can you actually do it this way? What if the tables had a million rows each? You can't take a million times a million, it will take forever. So that's not actually how it is implemented. But don't worry about efficiency. Okay, this is another very important thing with SQL. You don't worry about how efficient the operation is at the time when you write the query normally. Now, there are some things you may need to do to make operations efficient, but you can do that <coughs> separately. After the program is written, you can actually make some changes to the database, like adding indices and so on, to make the thing go faster. You don't have to rewrite the program. Okay? So you don't think imperatively. As a COBOL programmer, you might think, I need an index sequential file. I need to index on this and fetch this record and then find some value of this record and then go fetch another record using an index from another file. In SQL, when you write the query, don't even worry about it. Later, for performance, you may need that index. If you do not have an index sequential file, if you are searching sequentially through a file, things can be very inefficient. So you may have to go back and make sure those appropriate indices exist. And, uh, but that is a separate concern. So this separation of concerns means that you can ensure correctness of your query much more easily. It's very clear what this query does. If you wrote the same query with uh, index lookups and uh, fetches and a for loop and so on, it's a two-line query will stretch to probably 100 lines. I'm sure many of you would have written such queries. 
which access two tables. How many lines would that be? Something like this. Make a guess. We'll take the average. Yeah. Come on. Hmm? 20 lines, 30 lines. Yeah. You have to read both the files. Yeah. And then join it. Then again, 50, 60. And then the, there are going to be bugs. Yes. Then you have okay. to check for the, whether the file is available or not. Right. So there are a lot of things which you do. It will soon stretch to 100, yes. 200 lines even. And it will take uh, maybe a day or two to write thing, unless you are an expert programmer. Maybe you can do it in an hour. <laughs> but here you can uh, type this in uh, 10 seconds and you are done. OK, so now um, let's take a different query uh, where you want to find the loan number, uh, the name, and the amount of all customers. The name is the customer's name of all customers having a loan at the Redwood branch. Now, the cross product of these two tables, loan number and customer, has all combinations. But look at the query that we want. We want to find customers who have a loan at the Redwood branch. So um, uh, the customer name is here. Um, so that is available. The loan number is here. And then the mapping from loan number to customer name is in this table. So this query cannot be answered using this table alone or by using this table alone. There's not enough information in either of those tables. But together, they have the required information. And they're linked. How are the tables linked? Loan number over here. Okay, so what we want to do is find matching rows of this. You want to match this row, L170 downtown 3000, to this row of customer, and this row to this row. So the matching is done on the low number attribute. So how do we ensure that we match the rows appropriately? First, you do the cross product, and then you filter out rows which are equal on these two. So there's an additional condition here that it is at the Redwood branch. So there are two steps. First, you s select whatever attributes you want from borrower loan, where borrower dot loan number equal to loan dot loan number. What is that part doing? The from clause does a cross product. And then the first condition ensures that you consider only rows that actually match. The other rows in the cross product are thrown out. So we have only matching rows where a customer is matched with the loans that they have. And from that, we are further filtering out those which belong to the Redwood branch. In this case, this would be the sole answer. Of course, you can have multiple answers here, because output in general is a relation with multiple rows. It could also be an empty relation. Any questions? From the SQL execution part, hmm. whether it is uh, from the right to left side? Right? No, no. The there is no guarantee about how it is executed. In fact, there are a variety of uh, 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 smart algorithms for uh, implementing joins like this. The algorithms make sure that you don't first take the cross product, but rather they match uh, the things right. properly. Now, you have written code to do the matching, right? That is one kind of join, the nested loops with indexing to uh, find matching tuples. That is one kind of join algorithm. Uh, but that may not always be the best way of doing this join. Uh, so, in fact, any database system has multiple ways of doing joins, and it actually will figure out the cost of different ways and pick the best way. Okay, so you don't worry. About it. We'll come back to this on uh, day uh, four. That is, day after tomorrow, we will come back to this issue. Where it will not make a difference uh, in the where clause if I put this first, no. like branch name is equal to Redwood, and then I do the join. No. It does not make. It. It, correct. That's a good question. It does not matter in what order you put it. Uh, so it may look like you know, doing this first might save some effort, but you know, the database takes care of it. So you said, yeah. if borrower.loan yeah. number is given to select clause, maybe it is matching the both of the loan number will be saved. Right. Uh, so why is the, 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 the select clause? Uh, good question. If the uh, SQL uh, implementation is very clever, it can realize that these two are the same, so it does not matter. Okay, but to keep things simple, uh, the SQL implementation uh, says um, if the column name appears in two relations, you should say which one you want to pick it from. Because in this case, you have made them equal. But you could have written a different query. 
you could have said borrower dot loan number equal to loan dot loan number plus five, meaningless query, but you could write it that way. And then what happens? You have to explicitly specify whether you want borrower loan number or loan loan number. So it is, uh, you may find some implementations which will actually allow you to just say loan number. Um, however, to be safe, do it this way. But at least in this case, I don't think it will affect even if they're In this case, you could say yeah. loan dot loan it's number. Same, yeah. But you cannot just say loan number. That would, uh, the compiler would complain, saying uh, loan number is defined in two tables. Which one do you mean? If we don't specify the relation, it yeah. gives the ambiguity. Right? Correct. There is an ambiguity. And the point that she was making was actually the value is going to be the same here. So why can't it be clever? So. Yes, exactly. It is required. It is required. There may, what I'm saying is there may be some implementation which is very clever, but don't depend on it. That is in the uh, SQL standard, you should make it unambiguous like this. Yeah. If uh, the borrower, the row corresponding to, yeah. let's say, L230 is absent. Okay, L170 is absent, fine. Um, so, uh, first of all, in the cross product, what happens? L170 is paired with 230 and 155. But then when you apply the uh, loan number equals loan number, no, there will be no output. So, what has happened is, if there is no matching row here for this row, it vanishes from the join. Okay, so, this is an important thing to keep in mind. If you use a join, if there is no matching row, boom, it just vanishes. And this is a cause of a lot of errors in SQL programs, where you think there must be a matching row. Okay, but maybe there isn't. If you know the schema and you're guaranteed there is a matching row, then that's fine. If there may not be a matching row and yet you want the uh, loan to appear, well, there is a way of doing it. It's called outer join. We will be covering that tomorrow. Okay. So now let's look at a few string operations. These are very useful, they occur all the time. Uh, there are some basic uh, string matching primitives um, of which uh, the two most widely used are percent and underscore. Uh, so these are what are called wildcard characters. So here is an example. Um, select customer name from customer, where customer street like percent main percent. So what is this percent? It is a, a special character which says it can match anything. It can match an empty string. It can match any string. So when I say like, the like operator is special. It interprets the right argument of this. So the like operator takes its right argument. And if there is a percent, it says it can match any string. In this case, we have percent main percent. Or actually, I guess it is percent blank main percent. It is hard to tell from here. With, uh, with fixed sweep font, it will be clear. So now what all strings would this match? Any string in which main appears inside the string, main with capital M, small a, i, n. If that appears anywhere in the string, uh, then this will match. So all streets which are of the form first main, second main, third main, and so on, would match this. Okay, even if you had first main, uh, uh, east or something or some such thing following main that is also okay that will match okay so two percent ensure that if main occurs anywhere inside the string it will match it can be right at the beginning the street name can be just main nothing more that also matches uh, similarly underscore is a special thing which matches any single character so that is also useful sometimes now what if you want to uh, look for strings using the like operator which actually contain the character percent. Okay? So then you have to have an escape character. And in SQL, you make it explicit. So you say, uh, like main backslash percent escape backslash. You can use any character here, actually. And in the context of this thing, uh, the escape character says the immediately following character should be taken literally, not as a wild card. Uh, the slash means that the following character, in this case percent, should be taken literally. So what will this match? Like main backslash percent will match exactly the string main percent. The percent should appear in the string. 
it matches strings which have the characters main followed by the percent character. Otherwise, if you say percent, it will match anything. It is not case insensitive. It is case. Uh, so, uh, in the SQL standard, string matching is case sensitive. So, if you give this, even with the like operator, it will only match things which have capital M followed by small a i n followed by percent in this case. If you have small m a i n, it won't match. If you want it to match, you have to do something more, which is here. So, the standard way which you must have, many of you would have encountered, is to first convert the input string into, let us say, uppercase. It could be lower also. So, where upper customer street like percent capital all caps here main percent. Okay, so, whatever combination of lower and upper case you use, uh, this will match. Any questions? Now, be aware that there are some implementations of SQL which do not follow the standard. In particular, uh, SQL Server and uh, MySQL, uh, they will uh, allow matching ignoring the case by default. Yeah, uh, no, any string uh, here. Uh, it, by default, uh, st string matching ignores case in uh, both of these databases. In SQL Server, you can tell it to turn off the default and be case sensitive. In MySQL, I think you can't even do that. It's always case sensitive. Uh, and there are also other operators uh, for string matching, which allow more complex patterns. The more recent version of SQL have um, other, there is a tilde operator, um, but I will not cover that here. It is not that widely used, but it can be useful. Another useful string operator is the concatenation operator. So, if you have uh, different parts of a name which you want to put together, so if you have stored surname, first name and so on separately, but in the output you want a single column name, what do you do? You can say first name and then the concatenation operator which is the two vertical bars, so uh, two vertical bars and then last name. So, that will give you a single string which is the concatenation of these two. Um, so, there are uh, many other functions. For example, you can find the length of a string, the, you can extract a substring from a string. Uh, some of these are defined in SQL, but before SQL got around to defining them, many databases provided their own functions. So, you have a lot of non-standardness. So, exactly what the function is called depends on whether you are using PostgreSQL or Oracle or whatever other database you use. So, you should look up that database and use the appropriate functions. So, uh, here is uh, another query which says uh, find a list in alphabetical order the names of all customers having a loan at the IIT for a branch. This is the query we want to write. Okay, so, let us do it in steps. Let us first of all say where all do we get the information from? Customers having a loan at the IIT branch and their names. This is the same query we saw before. So, I mean it is a variant of a query we saw before. So, we know that the information is there in the uh, borrower and the loan information. These are the two tables containing that information. So, when we write a query, this is the first step. Where all is the information, which tables contain the information? This is the first thing you want to look at. It may all be in one table, it may be distributed across tables. So, in this case, we know two tables contain the information. So, we put those two into the from clause. And then the uh, condition, matching condition as before is borrower loan number equal to loan dot loan number. So, that is the matching condition for these two tables. Now, add the IIT Powai branch becomes and branch name equal to IIT Powai. And you want to list the names. So, select customer name. Can you have duplicates here? No. You have put a distinct, but without the distinct, could there be duplicates? Yeah, the same customer can have multiple loans. In fact, uh, we are making an assumption in this schema that customer names are unique, which is of course silly. Obviously, two customers can have the same name. Uh, so, why do we use that schema? Just to keep the examples short, you know, fit a width of a page or a slide. Um, but in the uh, exercises which you will be doing in the afternoon, we actually use a schema which has a customer ID in there. So, we are not assuming that customer names are unique anymore in the exercise schemas which you will be doing in the afternoon. 
So, but in the book and in the slides, you will find that customer name is used, assumed to be unique. But still, because a customer can have two or more loans, uh, customer name can appear multiple times here. So, we should put a distinct to ensure just one occurrence. And then, order by customer name <laughs> ensures that it is sorted. What is the default sort order? Ascending, alphabetically ascending. Um, SQL has actually a variety of uh, they are called collation, sort orders. Uh, it, SQL has been good, much better than most other languages in supporting, uh, most other computer languages, I should say, in supporting human languages because it is used to store different languages. So the sort order for English is different from the sort order for Hindi. So the SQL language actually allows you to specify different sort orders. You, you can uh, Although of late, uh, the Unicode standard is sort of superseding these things. Uh, but earlier, SQL could store, uh, you know, you could store it in ASCII, you could store it in ISCII, you could store it in anything else, and then define sort orders and get it sorted according to the specific language which you, uh, which you have stored. Um, and if you want it descending, you just say descending. So order by customer name, descending. more than one field, just list them one after another. So the primary sort will be the first one, the next one will be secondary. So if you want to sort on customer name descending, and then uh, in this case we have just selected customer name, but say we also selected the loan amount. Okay, so we want to find the customer names and the loan amount. So we sort on customer name primarily, and then secondarily on the loan amount. You just list one after the other. So you could say order by customer name descending, comma, amount ascending. You can choose whatever combination you want of descending ascending. Um, this may be a good point to try out some of these queries and see that they actually work. Okay, So I, I had this query, select star from account, and I executed it. And here are the accounts that I have. Account numbers are A1 through A10. And then there's some branch ID uh, in the uh, slides in the which we have been using, we assumed a branch name is unique, but again, more realistically, internally you would have a branch ID, which gives you the ability to change the branch name without changing the entire data. Uh, so, if Bombay became Mumbai, you could change the name from something Bombay to something Mumbai without affecting all the rest of your data. So, uh, in this case, we have used a branch ID. So, this account is in this branch, and this is the balance in that account. Uh, now let us uh, look for uh, branch. I hope you are able to read this here. The font is a bit small. I can. font size. Okay, I'm not sure how to change the font size here. But anyway, if you're able to read it, uh, I won't waste time on that. So we have uh, these six branches with a branch name, a branch city, and assets. These columns are the same as in the slides. Um, so uh, we have a customer. Now let's look at uh, borrower, which we were seeing. Okay, so earlier we had a name directly in borrower. Now we only have a customer ID, which maps to the customer relation, which we uh, saw. And these are the loan numbers. Uh, let's look at loan. So you have these eight loans at corresponding branch IDs with corresponding amounts. Okay, so these are the tables which we have. So let's write some queries joining multiple of these tables. So select star from loan, comma, borrower. Oops. Okay, what has happened now? Cross product. Um, 
you can see, there are lots of rows here. We had, uh, I think, eight loans and corresponding things in borrower. I think there were eight things in borrower, or maybe nine. Some of the loans may have been shared. And so you got a lot of rows here in the cross product. Now, obviously, most of those are meaningless. So what should the where clause here be? So loan dot loan number equal to borrower dot loan number. So in this case, the second row matches because both are L1. The first row here does not match. Um, come on. Oops. with that connection. Okay. Okay. So now we have got a much smaller number of rows which actually match. And you can <coughs> verify that the loan number here is equal to the loan number here. Note that the uh, column name shown here say loan number twice. Okay? So uh, the fact that it is borrower dot loan number or loan dot loan number is actually hidden. It is internally it is there, but it's just that the display is shown like this, just shown as loan number. And uh, then if you wished you could say loan dot uh, well let's just try loan number and yeah. see what happens. Yeah. Okay, so what is the error? Loan number is ambiguous. Okay, so now if you just say, what happened? Connection closed. Something went wrong. I think we lost the connection. I think we lost the wireless connection. Now claims to be back, but it's not working. Oh well. So since we are using VNC, hopefully the session will still be there. If you do loan dot loan number, this cursor is hanging behind. No, it came finally. Okay, so there is some lag here, but it's network delay. But anyway, it's there now. So we've got all the loan numbers correctly. Now, if I want it uh, order. We just saw the order by right. So let's, let's, let's going off the screen. So let's add an order by class. In this case, there's just one field. So we'll have to order by loan number. Now it's already, in this case, it happens to be sorted in ascending order. But like I said, there is no guarantee. It just so happened that this is the case. Now let's execute that. Yeah, good. And you want to try any other queries on this? Any of the other things we saw? Yeah. Okay, what are all the tables? Um, that depends on the tools which you use. In this case, with NetBeans, um, you went into <laughs> services, you went to a database, and there you have tables. And you can see here, that uh, you have account table. Um, when I expand on that, it's showing the 
columns of that table, but you can see the tables here, account borrower, branch and so forth. Mm. Mm. If you did not see it, that means it did not connect successfully. But you could not see it. I, I do not know what specifically went wrong, but normally you should be able to see it here. Um, otherwise, how do you find out what, is, what are the tables in a database? There are actually different ways of doing it in different database systems. In PostgreSQL, uh, you can uh, type slash d and get a list of tables or slash backslash d. Um, and, uh, but that, is, uh, that will not work directly from here. If you use the, there's a PSQL command. So from there, you can do that. Here, uh, you don't need to do it that way. Um, yeah, it depends on the database. The exact command to list the tables varies by database. One of the nice things about NetBeans is it hides some of these details. You can use the same whichever database you use. It will take care of it. Okay. And then if you type public dot. Yeah, I think there is some connections were, uh, in uh, NetBeans, uh, if you're not careful, it connects with. So, what is the schema business? The database can have multiple schemas, and uh, over here, uh, if you saw earlier, it said LIC dot um, LIC. Sorry, let's. Do it. Okay, when I say view data, what did it run? It ran this query: select star from LIC one dot account. Okay, so the LIC one is a schema name. What we have done now is create different schemas called LIC123, each of which has its own copy of the data, so that two of you don't use the same data. Then you can modify it without affecting others. Uh, so there is also some other schema called information schema, which actually has data about what tables are there in the database and so forth. So you shouldn't be using that schema, really. But when you set up the connection, there is a which schema should it connect to. Uh, if you don't specify it, it can I think it defaults in it means to information schema, and then you get into trouble. So we'll explore this in the lab. Let's not worry about it here. OK, questions? Let's go back to the talk. So we were, at this point, ordering the display. So we already um, saw this, that there can be duplicates, and you use this thing. Now, if you have a relation which has duplicates, and then you do an operation on it, you can get duplicates. If you had a relation which did not have duplicates to start with, if you project on some column, that column may have duplicate values. So if you looked at the uh, depositor or the borrower table, a person may have multiple loans. So if you look at the customer name from there, there can be duplicates over that. So if you project it, you can get duplicates. Now, if you have duplicates like this, and then you perform an operation such as uh, select how many duplicates do you get in the output? If you perform a cross product, how many duplicates do you get in the output? All of this is formally defined in SQL. Most of the time, you don't have to worry about this. You don't mess around with duplicates. Okay? But if you're interested in the details, they are there in the textbook. If you, at some point, need to worry about the number of duplicates, it's well defined in SQL. I'm going to skip it over here. Um, and of course, most of the time, when the output, you don't want duplicates in the output, you use a distinct. And the only place where duplicates really matter is when you do aggregation. We will discuss that when we come to aggregation. OK. So now, as uh, I told you earlier, SQL takes sets of tuples. What is a relation? It's a set of tuples. In fact, it's a set which can have duplicates. Technically, this is called a bag or a multiset in mathematics. Um, but we will use the word set loosely to allow duplicates also. So you take a set of tuples and output a set of tuples. Now, it makes sense that when you have sets, you should support set operations. The operations we saw so far were not the usual set operations, which you would have uh, seen in long ago, uh, but different ones. Now, what are the most common set operations which we use? Union, intersection, set difference. All of these are there in SQL, and there are queries where these are useful. Um, what is interesting is that the default union intersect and accept in SQL actually remove 
duplicates in their output. They can have duplicates in the input. The output removes the duplicates. Uh, but if you, uh, you don't want that, you can also use the all version. So that preserves duplicates. And then how many copies are there in the output? That's all precisely defined. We won't get into that. So here are some examples of queries. This time, I have not shown the query. I have just uh, shown the SQL query. I have shown the English query. So now, uh, let us try to write these in SQL. So find all customers who have a loan, an account, or both. How would you do this? What, all, uh, what are all the names of customers who have a loan or an account or both? So first of all, how do you find out who all have loans? Remember the relations which are relevant here. We have the loan relation that does not have customer names. We have the borrower relation which has a loan number and a customer name. So from the borrower relation, we can find the names of all those who have loans. Similarly, there is an account and a depositor table. The account table is exactly like the loan table. It has an account number, a branch, and a uh, balance in that account. And then there is a depositor table, which is just like the borrower table. So I have shown here the borrower and the depositor table. So the borrower table says that this guy has this loan. The depositor table says that this person has this account. So these are the two tables which have the information which we need to output. So the query here is find those who have a loan or an account or both. And implicitly, we may not want the name to appear more than once. You just want the names to appear once. Okay. So how will you write this query? Select distinct customer name from borrower. From borrower, comma, depositor? No. If you uh, if you write a query, so here is a suggestion. Select distinct customer name from borrower, comma, depositor. What will that do? It will take every pair from borrower and depositor, but there are two customer names, one from here and one from there. So that doesn't actually do what you want. So if you say select distinct borrower dot name from borrower, comma, depositor, it will only tell you who are all the people who have a loan. Similarly, if you say select distinct depositor dot customer name, it will only tell you those who have accounts. It does not tell you those who have either. So you have to use union. So you will do the following. Select customer name from depositor. So this will list all these names, Jones, Smith, and Hayes. Union, select customer name from borrower. Sorry, the other way. Depositor is here. This will give Hayes, Johnson, Johnson, Jones. And this will give Jones, Smith, Hayes. And then the union gives what? Each name, but exactly once, because union removes duplicates. Now, why does union remove duplicates? It's, the, it's some quirk of SQL. Don't worry about it. Uh, the default behavior is to remove duplicates. But if you don't want to, use union. Okay, so that query is straightforward. Okay, so we have the uh, same tables, except the schema is slightly different. We, instead of customer name, we have customer ID. <clears throat> okay, so the, these are the customer IDs from borrower. Are there duplicates? Yes. Customer ID 7 is duplicated here. Um, similarly, let's say depositor are there duplicates yes one is duplicated so is 6 and so is 7 okay so now if i say select star from depositor So what have we, no, it didn't execute the whole thing. Um, what happened here? No, this didn't work. In fact, I can't quite do this because 
the column names don't match. Okay, so what does union mean in this case? Um, I sh yeah, I should do customer name. No, why is it hanging? It should it should complain. So, yeah, I should, but I'm just wondering why this is not complaining. What what is happening? It, it should not do this at all. It seems to be just doing the first part of the query and then stopping. Come on, the network is really messing things up. Sorry, customer ID. You're right. In this case, it's customer. It, it looks like it is okay. Name does not exist, so at least they gave an error this time. Customer ID. That should do it. Hopefully. Okay. So now, uh, in this case, actually, all customer. I think uh, everyone had a loan and a account, so it doesn't really show a difference. But anyway, uh, that would have made a difference. And then if you say intersect, you will get the same result. Um, so, the next topic is aggregates. So, uh, what are the set of aggregates which, what is an aggregate? You, it, you have a set of values and then you combine them in some way. It is an aggregate. It is a typical aggregates are adding things up, sum, counting how many things there are, that is the count. Um, but you can also do average, min, max. And these, in fact, are the five basic aggregates which SQL supports. There are also other aggregates like uh, the uh, standard deviation, median, mode, and so forth, which are also supported. Um, we will use these for our examples today. And what do these aggregates operate on? They have to operate on a set of values. In fact, is it a set? No, it actually can allow duplicates. So, if I want to sum up the balances of uh, accounts at a particular branch, what will I do? I will have to first get all the balances at that branch and then sum it up. So, the balances of the branch can contain duplicates. You should not remove them and then you sum it up. So, here are a few sample queries and we are going to run them on this relation with branch name, account number and balance over here. So, find the average balance of the Perry Ridge branch, you do it as follows. Select average balance from account where branch name is Perry Ridge. So, what have we done here? There are two steps. First, find out all accounts at the Perry Ridge branch. So, in the from clause, you have account and branch name is Perry Ridge in the where clause. So, those are the first two things. Think of them in, as going in that order. First, the from clause with the cross product if required. Here, there is just one relation. Then, the where clause. And then the select clause is applied at the third point. Here, in the select clause, instead of just projecting out specific columns, what we have done is use an aggregate function. The aggregate function is going to take all the values that appear and then aggregate them into a single value. So, here it is going to give us the average of the balance. So, what will the average balance here be? Well, sum up these five numbers and divide by five, get whatever you get. Now, here is a, oh sorry, Perry Ridge, oh, the first two, 400 and 900, so 1300 by 2, 1650, 650, I need a coffee badly. So, take the second query, find the number of accounts in the bank. How do you do that? Use the count. Select count, in this case, we use a special notation star. Um, Count star means count how many rows there are. So, it is like saying listing all the um, attribute names there, 
but it's just a short form. I'm not counting how many branch names there are in account, how many account numbers there are in account, how many balances there are in account. That's not what I'm, I'm counting the number of rows. Use constar. So, so far, uh, these results are going to give you a single value. This is called a scalar value. It's, n it's not going to give you a set because we are taking an entire set of things and then applying an aggregate on it and getting a single value. So the question is, um, in this case, I found the average balance at Perry Ridge. But what if I want to do this at every branch? Not just for Perry Ridge, but for every branch, the average at that branch. Okay? So what I really want to do is something like this. Um, I want to take this table. Don't look at the query yet. Just look at the table, the input that we have. I want to group it, saying, let's take all the accounts at the Perry Ridge branch, all the accounts at the Brighton branch, all the accounts at the Redwood branch. And for each of those, individually, I want to apply whatever thing. Here I'm doing sum instead of average. So here, the sum of these two is 1,300. The sum of these two is 1,500. And the sum of this is, is itself 700. Okay, so this is what I want. And the way I write it is as follows. Select branch name sum balance from account group by branch name. The important thing here is the group by clause. So the uh, steps that happen here are first the from clause is applied. Then the where clause. Here there is no where clause. Okay, so no rows are filtered out. All the rows are there. Then you do the group by. So what is the group by here? Branch name. So what effectively happens is you take this table and break it into groups. How many groups do you have here? Three groups. So take the input table, break it into groups, and then finally come to the select clause. So what does the select clause do? Select branch name. Now the branch name is unique in each group because we have grouped by branch name. The branch name is unique. So that is well defined. The second thing in the select clause is sum of balance. Now, in each group, you can have multiple different balances. So we are going to sum up all of them to get the sum of balance. Okay, so that query will give us this result. Uh, here, I've given the name as, uh, of the output column as sum balance. But I, as I said, this is database specific. It's not a, a standard name for the column. Yeah, so you can't have multiple separate group bys, but you can say group by branch name, comma, something else if required. So then the groups will be finer groups. So for one, if you say, as you were saying, account type, you have three types of accounts, let's say, savings, current, and some, or two types, savings and current account. Then if you say group by branch name, comma, account type, you will get Perry Ridge savings, Perry Ridge uh, current, Brighton savings, Brighton current, and so forth, all the combinations, which exists in the data. If it so happens the Redwood branch does not have a current account, that combination will not appear. Only the combinations which appear will be there. So group by can have multiple columns. So the ultimate output will be uh, the combination of both, like the, uh, your branch name and then type of account. Uh, whatever you put in the group by and in the select clause. Okay, so. Uh, is the order of the field we must be getting the, like suppose in a hmm. branch wise, uh, account wise, hmm. we can also do account wise, branch wise also. You can do that. In fact, uh, the only difference between those two is the sort order. The, otherwise, it doesn't matter. So there is no difference if you say group by branch name account type. It is entirely equivalent to saying group by account type comma branch name. Because you have to order. You can add an order by at the end. If you want it sorted, the branch, and within each branch, the account type, then you use an order by. Just saying group by branch name comma account type does not guarantee it will be sorted in that order. Short is the last step which is performed on yes. the relation which is generated from the select clause. Exactly. So the steps are from clause, you take the cross product, where clause is applied to filter out rows, then you do group by, then, then select, the order. and then order. Okay. So I was not asking about the sorting. Yeah. Uh, what I was asking is, supposing you have a number of branches, yeah. and then underneath you have different types of accounts. Now yeah. suppose Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and then you want a subtotal for savings? Yeah, something like that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, so uh, let me explain this a uh, little more carefully. 
if you do group by um, branch name comma account type, what are the combinations that you get? Every combination of branch name account type that exists you get. Now if you say group by account type comma branch name, again you get the same set of groups. There is no difference in the groups that you get. It's exactly the same. But perhaps the query you're looking for is a sort of subtotal query which says uh, group by first on uh, let's say branch uh, and then on account type. So I, I'll say um, for uh, Perry Ridge uh, savings account, the sum is 5,000. For Perry Ridge current account, the sum is 6,000. For Perry Ridge all account types, the sum is 11,000. And then move on to the next branch. Okay, this is the sort of uh, you know statistics which you want to output. Okay, that cannot be done directly using the SQL aggregation. SQL actually has some more advanced constructs for doing that. Uh, but typically, people don't use that construct directly. Uh, there is a, a roll-up, uh, group by roll-up. There are some extensions which we can talk about later if you want. Um, it's there in the textbook if you want to read it. It's uh, in one of the later chapters, uh, which talks about decision support systems. Uh, so uh, there are uh, this sort of query is used uh, for data analysis and decision support. Um, so you can write such queries in an SQL version which supports it. Um, I'm not sure if PostgreSQL even supports that. Uh, but there are uh, a lot of systems for data analysis which will let you write such queries. Uh, most of the uh, Oracle, uh, SQL Server, IBM, all of them support it. I'm not sure if PostgreSQL does. But the commercial ones do support such tabular uh, reporting with subtotals. And then, of course, uh, that is still going to output it in some funny tabular format, which looks a bit odd. If you want it to be formatted properly as a report, you don't write it at the SQL level. You use a report generating tool, which will give you a formatted report. And it will generate the required SQL query. So you don't have to worry about the SQL query. You can use the reporting tool to do it. That is typically what people do in practice. Uh, they use reporting tools for this. So, you can uh, use uh, either, there are some commercial reporting tools, Crystal Reports and others, which you can use against a variety of databases. There are also some public domain reporting tools. Um, or you can use uh, reporting tools which come with the database and then use that to generate such reports. It's an important business requirement. So we are not covering it here, but uh, the use of a relational database makes all of that very easy, generating reports. Is you, you can just open a GUI interface, uh, you know, enter a few uh, pieces of information, and your report is ready. So we saw the group by clause. So here are some more examples with the group by clause. Find the number of depositors for each branch. This the previous query, previous thing we said number of depositors for each uh, branch. Uh, sorry, not that. That was that. There were two queries. One was find the number of depositors across the entire bank, regardless of the branch. And the other one was uh, sum of balance, so forth. So now what we are doing is find the number of depositors in each branch. So uh, suppose if something is appearing, if some attribute name is appearing between select and from. Um, and yeah, in the, that is in the select clause, you mean. And it has to appear in group by your. Yes. It, 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 no. So if you are exactly if you are not using an aggregate, it had better appear in the group by class. The other way is not required. So I can uh, do select count distinct customer name from depositor blah blah group by branch name. So what that means is there can be something in the group by which does not appear in the select class. That is okay. But if it appears in the select class outside of an aggregate, then it had better appear in the group by. Otherwise, this problem that you have a group with different values for that, and therefore you cannot output a single row for that group. So for a, when you have a group by, you output only one row for that group. That's guaranteed in SQL. At most, one row for each value there. OK, so in this case, uh, we did a group by branch name, and we did count distinct customer name. So the number of distinct customer names in each branch is counted. Is this equivalent, if you, if you add up these, across all the branches will that be equal to will that be equal to this one select count distinct customer name from depositor is this equal equivalent to first doing this 
and then summing up the uh, things across each branch. Hmm? Summing up the counts. Yeah, summing of the counts. I hope you understood the question. So here I am finding the number of distinct customers in each branch. If I add this up, is that the same as the number of distinct customers overall? Exactly. Correct. Correct. So if a customer is there in two branches, then we have counted that customer only once in the previous query. Here the customer is counted twice. But within each branch, a customer is counted exactly once, even if they have two accounts. Okay. So this point this, uh, says what we just discussed. Attributes in the select clause outside of aggregate functions must appear in the group by class. This is what we just saw. So the last topic we will cover before the break is the having clause. So the having clause lets us do the following. It lets us do the previous steps, which is uh, the from clause, the where clause, the group by clause, the select clause, all that is done. We have something. Now we want to filter again. So look at this query. Find names of all branches where the average account balance is more than 12,000. So there is a condition more than 12,000, sorry, 1,200 on the result of an aggregate. This cannot go in the where clause because in the where clause, you do not have the aggregate value. The where clause is applied first, immediately after the from clause cross product, Cartesian product, the where clause is applied. At that point, you do not have groups, you do not have aggregates. So this must be done later. And the way SQL lets you do it is by adding a having clause. So what we have done is select branch name average balance from account, group by branch name, um, having average balance greater than 1,200. So in fact, the having clause is done just before the select clause. Okay. So what it does is the from clause is applied, the where clause is applied, the group by clause is applied. So you've got the groups. Now you apply the having clause. So for each group, you compute the average balance. Check if that is greater than 1,200. If it is, that group is there in the output. Otherwise, the group is eliminated from the output. Now if the group is there in the output, what are you outputting? You are outputting the branch name and the average of the balance. In this case, we are outputting the same average balance. But you could output many more things. You could also output count of uh, account uh, numbers. You could, you could output any other aggregates you want. But only those groups which satisfy the having clause will appear in the result. Is this clear? The aggregates can be different in the select and in the having. Or they can be the same. It doesn't matter. But only those that satisfy the having clause will appear in the output. Yeah, you can have where. So if I wanted to, yeah. So the where clause is applied just after the from clause cross product. At that point, you do not have groups. Group by has not been applied. You do not have aggregates. Aggregation has not been done. Okay. So in the where clause, you cannot use average balance and so forth. However, the having clause is done after the group by is done. So from where group by you've got the groups now you do the having clause at this point you have the groups therefore it is meaningful to do the average balance on each group if you don't have a group by that is okay then the entire table is one group okay and then you are doing the having clause on the entire then the single group which is the whole table and if that satisfies the having clause then you do the output otherwise that particular group will not be there in the output. So if I drop the group by branch name, so I just take the same query, um, remove branch name from group by, there is no group by. Remove branch name obviously from the select also, it cannot be in the select anymore. Then what happens? What does that query mean? I will check if the average balance across all accounts, the whole bank, across all branches is greater than 1200. If so, I will output it. Otherwise, I will not output it. That is the meaning of that query. So the result can be empty or the average. 
in the having clause are applied after the formation of groups, whereas predicates in the where clause are applied before forming the groups. Okay, I think I'll uh, stop here.